All right, and welcome back to Dollars and Dragons. Today I have with me Kaya, if you'd like to introduce yourself to the audience. Hello, I'm Kaya. I am known as Mirror underscore Lock on Twitter, Twitch, and Itch. I am a LARPer, a TTRPG player, DM, and recently an ED game designer. Let's start with how you kind of got involved with role playing back in the day, as it were. Um, you're a big LARPer. So I actually um, used to do forum role playing just way back in the day. This would be when I very first started getting into role play. Um, and I did that for a while. And I also got into D&D as a teenager with my teenage friends. Uh, but those were not super role play heavy. It is when I got into LARPing in 2008 or 2009 um, that I really plunged into what it would be like to be immersed in a role play sense. And it was completely accidental. I was on my way to visit a friend for the weekend. And on the way up, while I was on the train, I got a message saying, hey, I'm involved in this activity and somebody just dropped and we really need somebody to come in and do this like tomorrow. Can you please like consider it? And so I said, sure. Hey, you know, if you are going to be doing this thing anyway, then I'm down to try it out. And um, that is how I signed up for a 14 hour straight experience. Um, it was a mashup of... Um, Revolutionary Girl Utena and Neon Genesis Evangelion, just the two casts of those anime, the the lore of the two series got blended together and there was this like this overarching plot. And I saw very little of it because as any one individual player, you know, you only see what that one character ever gets to see. And it was very large and intricate. And I was hooked. Um, I was overwhelmed with the idea that there might be these incredibly immersive and all-encompassing experiences like this. And so I continued to LARP uh, with that group for the next four or five years until I uh, had to move away, but I still regularly go back and uh, and play in other LARPs with them. When you first started, were you given like, hey, here's your character sheet? Or like, how did they manage that? Yeah, exactly. They provide the rules and um, sheets that give you any information that you might know as a faction that not everybody knows. And then they also give you a character sheet, which in this style of LARP, uh, and I want to clarify here, I'm not talking about Boffer LARPs. Um, when people say LARP, often the thing they're thinking about is, you know, people whacking each other with foam swords in the woods. Uh, that's Boffer LARP. I have a great deal of respect for Boffer LARPers. Uh, they are often some of the most physically fit people I know because, you know, you, you swing a sword for eight hours a day in the woods, you are, you know, you are getting your exercise. Um, but I'm talking about theater LARPs. Um, and specifically in my tradition, um, you get character sheets that delve very deeply into your character's psychology. So you are told everything that your character knows, everything that's motivating your character, uh, everything that your character wants to get out of this. Um, and often you go in with sort of like a game plan of what your character wants and uh, plans to do. And then partway through the game, there's this big reveal um, or a series of little reveals after you talk with other characters that just recontextualizes everything that your character knows and you have to think on the fly and it's really cool how does conflict normally result depends um each larp generally has its own dis has its own bespoke um mechanics and so in some games you're expected to get into physical conflict often. And then the physical conflict is represented with rock, paper, scissors, or like a deck of combat cards, and each of you flips a card over at the same time. And then in some games, um, the game itself is not supposed to be about conflict. It's maybe, you know, about being a whole bunch of political leaders trying to have uh, political discussions and hammer out a code of conduct or a constitution going forward. And then, um, what's considered physical conflict within the setting is supposed to be like a very rare and uh, 
very highly discouraged occurrence. And there may or may not still be rules to handle it, but the majority of the quote unquote conflict in the game will be, uh, you know, verbal back and forth. I always imagine LARPs a particular, because I've never, first of all, I've never been to one. So um, I think the closest I ever got was we had a bunch of, I guess they were, I guess they were called bof, bof LARPers. Um, Buffer, yeah. Yeah, boffers. Uh, because my brother got into that with the PCP pipe and like the foam and right, yeah, things like that. Yeah, I think I was like seventeen or so when that came around. Although I never like attended. I have always been interested in uh, weapon fighting, and then of course I moved on to do some weapon fighting, like within my um, career. But have you ever done any sort of like buffer or like any sort of training in that respect for with weapons? Tell me about that. Yeah, um, I dipped my toes into a bit of buffer LARPing as well when I moved to the area. Um, and the buffer scene is incredible and also incredibly different. The theater LARPs I play are generally uh, just one shots. And you might have like sequel LARPs that return to the same setting, but it's absolutely the exception. Boffer LARPs in my area, at least, tend to be very long-term campaigns. And so it has actually even more of a TTRPG feel because you come up with your character within the character creation system that that particular LARP has. You might even be choosing your particular skills or you might be choosing a character class. And then you show up and there are the game runners that run modules, um, which as far as I can tell, the um, closest parallel to it would be individual scenes in one session of D&D or your TTRPG of, of choice. And so uh, you will be there and, you know, in costume, in character, interacting with the other PCs. And then every so often uh, you'll be told that, you know, hey, there's a plot hook. Uh, come this way if you want to engage in the plot hook. And then you'll have NPCs that pop out and you might be talking, you might be fighting. And then, you know, you you pull out your buffer weapons and you go at it. Um, but they're actually quite story heavy, or they can be. And you get XP, you can level up your character between sessions and gain new abilities. Um, and it's uh, it's a sort of way to bring your TTRPG mindset into a more immersive format. So I actually think that a lot of TTRPG players might be interested if uh, you want to stand up from around the table and uh, get a, a sword or a bunch of um, spell packets into your actual physical hands. Yeah, I think the next step, I suppose, then is virtual reality. Do you have any insight on that as far as like if LARP groups are starting to move to VR? So virtual reality, um, in terms of getting like an Oculus headset or anything like that, um, that might be a very distant goal or dream. I'm not aware of any uh, substantive VR LARPs in that sense. It is true that during the pandemic, a lot of people who couldn't LARP in person uh, have started writing LARPs that could be run on Zoom or on Discord. And some of them have very interesting in-setting ways to explain why you're all on screens rather than in person. Uh, one of them is, for example, uh, everybody is in a spaceship, uh, sort of very Star Trek flavored, and a virus has invaded the ship and engaged the ship's security measures and you are physically locked into different rooms. Do we need to get the bot back in? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Moment. Um, Craig being a problem, Craig. Yeah, my my other Craig didn't drop though, so we're we're technically good. So okay. if if the other Craig drops now, the backwards Craig, then stop, and then like I have to refix it. But okay. Keep going, please. Um, and so the premise of the game is that you're all locked into these different rooms, and you're talking to each other over the video screens notionally in the rooms that you're in um, and you have to work together to figure out how to uh, defeat the virus and get out of uh, of this emergency state. Yeah, that's fairly interesting. And I, I think there's so much that parallels game design in the way that you describe that. And I think that's an easy stretch for you then at that point to start uh, des 
designing games. Uh, when did you start playing D and D, and when did you start GMing? Technically, I started playing D and D when I was twelve. Um, one of the friends that I'd made in summer camp um, invited me and a bunch of the other close friends that we had made over um, just to her house and. Her older brother, uh, who is very cool and a lot more of a nerd uh, than I was at the time, offered to run a D&D one-shot for us. Uh, and so we made our characters and we had a delightful little adventure. And I wanted to play more, but I didn't have friends local to me at the time that were interested. And so I got more into it in high school when I did find a bunch of friends who were um, interested in playing, but it was sort of the thing to do casually as a hangout with your friends. Um, I would say that the first time that I played in a campaign where everybody was super invested in their characters and the story that everybody was making together um, was probably 2018, 2019. Um, by then, I considered myself to be somebody who had played D&D a lot um, because I had been playing 3.5, 4E, 5E. Uh, but this was different in my mind. This was a chance to bring everything that I knew about uh, character psychology and game design and everything from LARPs into uh, a format that I thought was familiar. Um, I ran, I started running games not long after that. Um, I started my Curse of Strahd game in 2020, possibly 2019. Um, it must have been 2019. It was uh, before the pandemic. Uh, right. The last, you know, the last three years have just been one long year blob. Did you do anything in particular for your Strahd campaign that you were altering it to fit a certain style that you had as a GM? How did you run your Strahd campaign? Um, I read through Mandy Maud's Fleshing Out Curse of Strahd guide. Yeah. Um, I glanced through the official Curse of Strahd module, and then I promptly like ripped out and threw away about 60% of it. Yeah. Um, I altered the game to primarily tie into the backstories of the PCs in my game. Okay. So this is a character first approach that, um, you know, is heavily influenced by my LARP design thoughts um, because LARPs, you can have a GM, but they're not there in the game guiding um, whatever's going on. You know, you don't have sort of voice of God telling you, all right, this is now what you see or you know, what What are you going to do to react? Um, all of the game structure and content is in your character sheets. And then while you're LARPing, um, you know, some of those secrets are going to come out and that's going to spur other things to happen with other characters. And I wanted to bring that into my GMing. So after my players submitted their proposed backstories, I gave them supplementary information that they would know uh, that built off of what they had in their backstories. But it was packed with seeds for things that would happen later on in the campaign, where once something happened, they would react to it because they had this pre-existing information. Um, they ha they might have had uh, pre-existing motivations to interact with something in a certain way. They might have realized that this unknown thing that they had stumbled across uh, in Barovia, this far off secluded land, was actually tied to their main drive or quest or something like that. There are a lot of primary uh, pillars of the Curse of Strahd campaign that ended up in my campaign getting reskinned to fit the needs of the character arcs that my PCs were. Kresk got completely gutted and rebuilt, and then it never actually got seen because my party never went there. Yeah, um, that's going to happen. The Amber Temple, uh, the history and purpose of it were completely changed, and um, a strong parallel thread to what the PCs were going through was a, another party about 25 years ago that I you know, made up out of whole cloth. Um, where every member of that earlier party uh, had some connection to a member of the current party. And then the current party would see 
the signs and the fallout of uh, what had happened with this earlier group that had tried to overthrow Strahd and had failed. First of all, that sounds brilliant, and I would love to play in that game. Um, <laughs> and then secondly, how long did that game run for? Um, it ran for just over a year, I want to say. Um, it was 42 sessions in all. Mm-hmm. Um, we, you know, we're primarily playing every week, but we skipped some weeks. Um, yeah. you know, holiday season always kills campaigns temporarily. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was right before Twice Bitten started that my campaign ended. And so I sort of glided from running Curse of Strahd straight into playing Curse of Strahd, which was an experience. How did you get picked up for that? And how did you start working with uh, Dragna Carta on Twice Bitten? So Dragna Carta had a just a late night thought on the Curse of Strahd subreddit's Discord um, about what Rules as written, Curse of Strahd is supposed to be for. Basically, nobody runs Curse of Strahd rules as written. Um, there's so much community um, just consensus about what needs to be changed, uh, what could be changed, how much more you get out onto it. Um, and it's a very common occurrence that people who are so steeped in this community lore don't realize that various aspects of it are not actually in the printed book. Uh, nobody reads the printed book, nobody runs from the printed book. And so Dragno was thinking, well, what is the actual design intent of the module as it was presented here? And he came up with the hypothesis that it was meant to be a crucible, uh, that the point is not that your heroes come through and fix Barovia and then Barovia is fixed. The text clearly says, you know, uh, once you leave, like Barovia actually is going to reset. Uh, and so he was thinking, no, the, the point of this is not to fix Barovia, but to let Barovia change you, change your characters, make them into heroes. And then he decided to run a game to test this hypothesis. And there was just um, an open casting call uh, in the server. And I happened to be the very last one who messaged him in time to get in. As far as I can tell, he was accepting people who were interested in the concept. Uh, I, you know, if if there was an elaborate uh, evaluation rubric for which players he wanted to take, uh, he's never said a word about it. Uh, and so I was just very lucky uh, to be able to join that group. How long did uh, Twice Bitten run for, and what was your experience like? So Twice Bitten ended up running for about a year and a half. Um, our epilogue episode was episode 53, and it was a surreal experience. Um, we didn't really go in at the very beginning, at the pre-planning stages, with the thought that this would be a broadcasted actual play. Uh, I originally thought this was just going to be sort of a home game. And then uh, once we decided to broadcast this, we figured that only maybe like a dozen people on the Discord server would be interested. You know, we had hopes and dreams of sort of making it big, but it was um, it was a surprise how many people ended up being interested in our campaign and our characters and everything we were doing. Um, I'm still just, you know, very gratified and surprised every time I see somebody who wants to borrow uh, something that we did in the campaign for their home game. It was also surprising how little we remembered as players about what was coming up in the module. Because once again, nobody ever reads the module. Um, there's all sorts of hidden things in there that nobody ever actually runs. And uh, they were complete surprises. Um, the Taroka reading, for one, um, I think most DMs run that or find a way to nudge the players into going to a place where they can get the reading fairly early on. As written, there's none of that nudging. Uh, we didn't get our Taroka reading until, I think, episode 20-something. Wow. Um, yeah. And so there was, uh, there was a lot more of the feeling of oppressiveness and gloom and hopelessness uh, rather than a theme of heroism and, you know, going around being do-gooders, which I think is prevalent in a lot of home games. And as a result, uh, there are some people who have just 
straight up said, uh, this campaign is way too gloomy for me. You know, it's not fun for me to listen to. And that's absolutely valid. Um, there are plenty of bots in that campaign where it was not fun to play. Um, you know, if you commit to a character arc that takes you from being somebody who is cowardly or broken or selfish and turns you into a hero, um, it's not going to be fun to start out cowardly or broken or selfish. Uh, and it's also not always going to be fun um, having the content of your character sort of broken down and then remade. Uh, a crucible is not a fun place to be in. So um, it was certainly a transformative experience. Um, and separately, the experience of being in and helping to produce an actual play uh, was also a transformative experience and one that I highly encourage anybody who's thinking of doing that to seriously evaluate how much time and effort you want to be putting into doing the work for that versus how much you want to be somebody who has done it. If you're going in purely looking for the prestige of it and um, really stealing yourself for the production work that goes into it, then um, do your research beforehand. Make sure you know what you're getting into. Absolutely. I do want to talk about what you mean by production work, but I also want to ask, and of course, spoilers, uh, if you are planning on listening to Twice Bitten, I want to ask if you could briefly explain your character's story arc throughout Twice Bitten, because I think that would be really cool to hear from your perspective. Sure. Um, my character was named Lillison, and she is not a good person. Um, I am always surprised that people didn't realize until the Amber Temple that she was, in fact, uh, lawful evil. She thought of herself as a monster because as a sorcerer uh, with the Green Dragon bloodline, she was attuned to poison magic and didn't realize this um, for most of her childhood. And so she was basically accidentally poisoning and, and killing um, a lot of the people around her. Uh, and then once she and her family did realize this, you know, nobody's going to tell a child you are a murderer, but the extent to which her family had to sort of maneuver around what she had done and make restitution and stuff like that sort of ingrained it into her mind that this was in fact all her fault. So she's made peace with being a monster. She is studying how to be an effective monster and has um, a troubled relationship with her magic. And that's the person that she went into Barovia as. Her arc essentially was a rejection of the idea that you can redeem yourself um, and become a good person. She does not believe that she can be a good person and does not believe that that's, you know, even a goal that she should want to attain. She wants to be a responsible and effective monster. And so it was a lot of um, learning how to live with yourself while accepting that you can't live with yourself. Um, a lot of learning um, how to control yourself and then how to wield that control effectively. And a lot of how to amass power without burning bridges. Um, the part about not burning bridges is very important to her. And by the end of it, I think she comes out as somebody who is a lot more confident in what she can do and confident that she can make her choices um, deliberately and effectively for her purposes, rather than fearing that whatever she do is going, that whatever she does is going to be twisted into bad things that she didn't even intend. I am actually um, currently writing an epilogue for her in the framework of one of the games that I have written. Um, the, the game in question is called Her Odyssey. Um, it is a game set up to chronicle the journey of your wanderer who's trying to find her lost home or make a new home for herself. And I figured that one year after the the broadcast of the last episode of Toy Spitten would be a great time to drop in 
and see what Lillison is up to uh, one year after she has escaped Barovia. So that is going to be published on my website um, on February 19th. Do you remember writing this? I remember writing that. <laughs> Did you know I was going to bring this up? I didn't. Tell, I For the audience, I didn't tell. Um, I did not know that you were going to bring this up, but I recently <laughs> I remembered, <laughs> uh, I recently remembered that I had written that and, yeah. uh, and that you had won, had won the giveaway for it. So, uh-huh. uh, yeah, I always wondered, um, you know, what you and the character that she was writing to, uh, made of it. Um, well, I guess we're about to find out because I've actually never read it before. Really? I was... Correct. Yeah. Um, wow. Due to a number of circumstances, but I was thinking uh, to myself, the more time that went on, I was like, well, if I'm going to read it at this point, I think it needs to be meaningful in some way. So I literally have like just opened it. So wow. I'm- okay. <laughs> Get your live reaction. <laughs> yeah. So uh, let me, you, you have wonderful handwriting. So I apologize if I jam any of this up um, and I'll, I'll not embarrass myself with uh, a Lillison impression, but Sir Uh Rice Coldries, you do not know me, but I hope that you will forgive me for my presumptuousness in writing to you thus. I should start by stating that I know something of you and your deeds. You may or may not remember an incident some two or three years ago when you came to the aid of a half-elf who was fighting through a nest of zombies near an old windmill. I'm certain this must have been a a commonplace event, but the incident left a striking impression upon, uh, does that say the man you aided? Um, The man you aided. I do not know what name he may have given you at the time, but his true name was, forgive me for this, Isidus? Isides Winterstar, one of the spy masters of... My father spoke of this incident and of you more than once, and in the most... Your quick thinking, expert knowledge, and decisive action, as he described it, saved his life and the lives of his fallen companions. I offer now my humble hope that you might be able to aid me in the same way. I know that you have made it your life's mission to fight against the undead. I am presently in need of any and all knowledge you might have against your foe. Suffice to say, I find myself trapped in a land filled with ghouls, gas, revenants, and vampires, and that is only what I have encountered in my mere three weeks in this land. Of all of these, it is vampires I must learn of most urgently, their weaknesses, their tricks, the dangers to beware when dealing with them. But any assistance at all would be most gratefully accepted. I must confess that even as I write, I have little hope of your response. The lord of this realm has granted me a boon of sending a letter out of his realm, but receiving a reply, much less a reply that might contain a strategy to destroy him, seems pitifully unlikely. And so I must beg a second favor of you. If you hold any mercy or kindness in your heart at all for the plight of a stranger, please find Isides that I... Isides. Isides. Winterstar again, and inform him of his daughter's fate. Yours, with failing hope, Lillison Winterstar. W- at what point in the campaign did this did Lillison write that? Um, that would have been around. I want to say episode thirty to thirty-five, somewhere in there. Um, so yeah, uh, right when she was uh, least expecting to make it out of Barovia alive. Yeah. Wow. That character that uh, Rice uh, Cold Reese, that was my first podcast stream character as well. Oh, wow. So I remember that happening and I was like minorly like freaking out because I remember listening to the podcast and like thinking to myself as I was just starting to get more into D&D and more into tabletop and really being drawn to level of performance was on the cast and the GM did an exceptionally good job for everything um i thought at least as a listener right so i remember your performance and like just listening to you having that really big impact on me and like inspiring me to like uh work more in the field so thank you for that i'm honored i remember asking you for a little bit of you know information on rice um and it was a bit tricky to think of you know a way to um justify writing a letter that didn't also you know shoehorn a connection you know in your character which is you know always very personal to you um Mm. just to be able to you know write my letter and so the framing device that i came up with uh i thought was uh 
was a reasonable compromise. Yeah, and I, I apologize for not getting back to you, but I have ADHD, so... <laughs> No worries. Um, I am very pleased that uh, I got to see your reaction live. Yeah. Um, yeah, you definitely did. I, yeah, that's, wow, that's wild. Very cool. I'm glad we have this connection. That's yeah. so cool. Let's talk about the production of Twice Bitten and like what were surprises for you and like what would you say were key things that you learned coming out of that production about just creating podcasts and things like that? So the primary producer for the show was uh, Jip Lucas, who is uh, an absolute saint, um, somehow managed to produce the show while undergoing, you know, just a very um, like a highly regimented school um schedule and also flying back and forth uh, for the school semesters and having to bring his computer and um, Jeplucas is is amazing. I was on the audio editing side um, because shortly after we started streaming on Twitch, enough people asked for a podcast version that uh, we talked about making a podcast version as well and I um arrogantly stepped up and said oh yes i have experience being a podcast audio editor um at the time my experience consisted of editing a very amateur uh you know startup kind of uh podcast that a friend and i had made um to discuss playing retro video games and you know we sort of had an upload schedule but became a matter of you know whenever we got around to it and the episodes were maybe only like 10 to 20 they were short episodes um twice bitten was not that thing um and editing four hour long episodes every single week um with six people on the voice tracks was a very different beast that's and I, yeah, I started out um, just with as fine tooth a comb as I had been doing for this other podcast uh, and very quickly discovered that I could not keep up with that. Um, and so there was a lot of just balancing how much time can I put into this sort of fine tuning audio editing, um, you know, lining up the music, cutting out mouth noises from everybody, cutting out background noise. Uh, how can I balance that with the need to have these four hour long episodes uploaded within 12 days of the original recording? And then uh, as we changed our production schedule, it became, you know, how can I get them uploaded within five days of the original recording? Um, and I was not sufficiently prepared for for the burnout. Near the end of production um, near the end of our broadcast, um, we actually ended up hiring uh, a third-party audio editor to handle uh, the editing and the uploads and the tagging. And that took so much off my plate. Uh, it was it was unbelievable. Um, it's also the case that we ended up having a sort of secondary show, the Fireside Chats, that aired in the middle of our broadcasts. And so recruiting guests for that and uh, getting them in touch with Jeplukas, who was the actual um, interviewer for those, and then getting the audio and cutting down the audio and editing that and uploading it in a audio form for Twitch broadcasts it was going to be played on. Um, and then also uploaded in the podcast slot. It was uh, a lot of extra work that because the idea for this had sort of just bubbled up organically over the course of producing the show, uh, it was not something that any of us had really strictly sat down and planned out for in our sort of pre-production plans. Um, and so sort of taking on that extra project uh, was another unexpected task that I hadn't planned to pick up, but couldn't really put down because uh, it was also not something that anybody else on the cast had signed up for either. Um, and Jack, uh, who played Metreon slash Lucian, um, was actually super great at picking up that task just on weeks when I had too much else going on and couldn't get to it in time. Uh, Jack is a total sweetheart and, um, you know, he also did a lot of the graphic design for our stream overlays, our buttons, um, just everything in, in that regard. 
and you know also did video editing for um the uh earth and deer adventuring interviews so yeah um there's always just a lot of unexpected tasks that will come up and then you know somebody's got to do them um and when those are distributed unevenly um over the members of a cast just because of who happens to have extra time and energy or who happens to have the required expertise to do something, um, it can get very strained. Advice to anybody who is uh, looking to do an actual play, um, just try to foresee as much of those production tasks as possible. And if you have to, you know, if you want to, if you are capable of doing it, hire outside people to take care of them. You know, obviously make sure you vet professionals, hopefully professionals um, that you're hiring. Don't feel like you have to keep everything in-house all the time. Um, take care of your own um, energies and your own mental health. You know, especially if you're already a performer or a producer, uh, don't don't feel like you have to martyr yourself on production as well. Yeah, it's it can be a difficult spot because people, I think, falsely assume that there's something really great and wonderful, I suppose, at the end of the tunnel for uh, all of this additional effort. But uh, most of the time for life plays and actual plays, like what is at the end of the tunnel? It's just like you have experience now. And that's about it. A lot of the time, right? Yeah. What was your experience? How was that changed by the end? Did you in some way feel like you had gained something really invaluable from your experience? Sorry, one moment. I'm going to see what happened with that door. Okay, yeah, no problem. <laughs> Sorry about that. Was it a ghost? Uh, it might have been my cat. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, sorry, can you repeat the question? As I completely forget what the question was. Oh, for your uh, experience with Twice Bitten, what sort of skills do you feel like you came out of there with that were just boons to you moving forward? What, what did you gain as far as like experience and like skills? Um, in terms of experience and skills, um, came out with um, a much better understanding of how everything that I had learned in LARPs about portraying a character could be sort of cross-referenced on to depicting a D&D character. Um, and I have a lot of thoughts about that. And one of these days I will get around to actually writing up the articles um, that I have been promising for literal years. I also um, came out with a lot more audio editing experience. Um, because I had to learn a lot in order to keep up, you know, not just with the volume of work that there was, but the quality that I wanted there to be on the podcast version. I think that being on Twice Bitten also helped a lot with my own um, DM philosophy of seeing what really worked and what I would change and how to adjust that for every table. But I think that the most valuable thing that I came away with was just the realization that there were so many people out there who were invested in uh, my character, in all of, you know, our collective story. Um, and it turns out in all the future work that I've done since then, and that it surprises me every day, honestly. Yeah, it's kind of a, I think there's something like the stars kind of aligned for Twice Bit, in my opinion, in, in a lot of ways, because you started with a platform or with the subreddit as an initial audience. And from there, it was very obvious from the start of that show. I was personally just at the time, and perhaps like there are a lot of shows that meet at this level now, but at the time when I first started watching that show, uh, I was saying to myself, how the fuck is this production so good? I was just <laughs> blown away at like the production value of like just the little things done correctly and everything was very smooth, sounded great. I was very impressed with the production value provided and it just looked like a highly professional show, a bunch of volunteers. And I was really blown away by that. So if there's any like Curse of Strahd, listen that you, I, I would say there's a good argument that you would have that it should be twice bitten. Uh, I think that I wouldn't run Curse of Strahd as written for a number of reasons. But if I'm going to listen to it as a form of art, I would listen to twice bitten, in my opinion. Thank you so much. Yeah. I think it helped that we were not on video. I think that um, what people saw was Jack's amazing professional layout design, 
plus the very clever uh, Discord bot showed the character portrait uh, whenever anybody spoke. And those character portraits um, done by Runesale, uh, who is a fantastic artist and a good friend, um, really, you know, together really helped sell the, you know, and also the the amazing background art from um, James RPG Art. Uh, who has a Patreon and who has been doing this for a very long time. I think that that really helped sell the idea that we were, <laughs> that we knew what we were doing. I completely forgot about that is how I got in touch with RuneSale. I had hired RuneSale for some work uh, for an actual play, like some portraits and things, and they were very generous with their time. Uh, they did high quality work. And I actually just somehow slipped them in for the onto the vineyard artist team so now i'll have three people uh for that um their work won't begin until after the kickstarter funds but because i have to kind of limit with the budget what's getting done beforehand for the campaign uh but it was kind of a no-brainer as soon as rune sale became available for work again i was just like as soon as i saw that tweet i was just like in their dms again i was like hey so you're free for work right like let me talk to you about some that is so good for me to hear. Um, I am I am super excited to see what they do on the vineyard. Yeah, they are an impressive artist, and I really like to watch them work. They stream their work a lot of the time as well, um, so it's very fun to sort of go back and like watch a the time the time lapse of it and just watch uh, someone with that many years of experience work yes. like that. It's it's incredible, and yeah, then they're just a gem to talk to. So it's not about stuff uh art and you know other stuff like that but how'd you get started on game design i know your larping roots but like when did you start putting the uh putting the stuff out there on itch so not that long ago um just about a year ago um i just came across um lex titanomaki on twitter um talking about Keltrop Core, which is a very lightweight and flexible SRD that is all about the D4. And Lex was saying, this SRD is so simple that, you know, you can download it and then be a game designer by the end of the day. So I thought that is a bold claim. I shall perhaps download it and take a look. And I read it and I said, this is interesting. And I put it aside. And a few weeks later, um, I was in the shower and I was just suddenly struck with the idea of like how to write a game that is about exploration and specifically exploring the mindset and backstory of the stereotypical, you know, cloaked and hooded traveler sitting in the corner of the tavern with the dark, mysterious backstory. Like, I, I want to generate that dark and mysterious backstory. And so I got the idea of how to integrate the Caltrop Core D4 system with another um, fundamental mechanical base uh, that I am actually going back and I'm currently writing my own SRD out of involving uh, a deck of cards and dice rolling. Uh, so that's coming out soon. So those two ideas collided in my mind and I just thought, all right, I'm going to get this down on digital paper. Um, I'm going to put this out there and like, that will be my Caltrop core game. It'll be, it'll be done. It'll be over with. Little did I know. Um, and so the result, her odyssey, um, has a lot more popular than I had expected. I am just so surprised just all the time. Um, how many people have picked it up and used it to flesh out their own character backstories and just the amount of creativity that people bring to it. Um, every single time I see uh, somebody stream playthrough or, you know, read a written account, um, you know, once people have done their playthroughs, it's in a completely different setting. There's different tones. I think that what I've done is created a framework basically for people to pour in their own stories and to have the the content of that story be incredibly personal to them and their characters. Uh, and I'm very proud of that. The second game that I designed was also in Caltrop Core, and it was for a Caltrop Core jam. 
Um, it's called Pearl and Provenance. And, you know, much like the first one that was sort of exploring a character backstory, Pearl and Provenance is a world building and myth making game. Um, you and another player are demigods who fled a disaster and are trying to build up a suitable new world uh, out of formless water. And what usually ends up happening is uh, as people are picking up domains and creating their races and creatures and, you know, natural landmarks and stuff like that, um, usually uh, one demigod PC will end up getting jealous about how much a race is venerating, you know, the other demigod PC and the two demigods end up. Um, and I think that it generates a lot of the types of creation and, um, you know, explanatory myths um, that you come across in fantasy settings. And I've also seen a ton of creativity and startling creature design and, um, you know, very lavish and elaborate world building that's come out of that. Um, and once again, I'm proud of having made a canvas that other people can use to express their own creativity. How many uh, games are you planning to make in 2023? Do you got like a, a goal here? Well, um, I ended up making four full games and two odd bijou uh, in 2022. So I would like to make at least as many in 2023. Um, I have one that's in playtesting right now. Um, but it's also possible that I'm going to make you know, two games that are approximately the same size as my current games, which are uh, anywhere between, you know, five to 20-ish pages for my full releases. So I might, you know, make two games that are about that size and then embark on this other dream project that I have that will be like a, a hundred page system and setting and source book. I have an ambition. I have an idea. Uh, I just don't know whether this year is going to be the year when I try to, you know, start tackling that. Got it. Are you willing to talk about it? I will just provide a single mysterious hint. Uh, and that hint is city gods. Okay. <laughs> That's all I'm willing to say at the moment. For Undo, this was a Twitter game, uh, a poll game, essentially, that I saw you run last year. I found it to be very interesting. What inspired that? So... Yeah, Undo. Um, I was running that on my Twitter uh, right when I was trying to, you know, network within the TTRPG community. And so a lot of the very first connections and mutuals and friends that I made back then um, really interested and invested in this, this, what I considered to be a rather silly thing that I was doing. So it took the form of kind of a choose your own adventure in that every day I would make a tweet that would describe what the what the PC was doing and then provide four options for further uh, interaction or um, paths to take exploration wise and everybody could vote on what the next day's action and consequences would be. These options were not always clear in what they were or what the consequence would be. Um, in fact, I think many people would say they were almost never clear. Um, so I was trying to capture this feeling of coming into a world, a situation, you know, even a viewpoint character, having absolutely no idea what was going on, just being dropped right in, that being mirrored within the world as... Um, it turned out uh, playing a an android character who had just had their mind completely wiped um, and who had come back to sentience for some unknown reason. The sense of going into a game or a situation with absolutely no knowledge and trying to figure out not only what you needed to know, but why you needed to know it uh, is incredibly compelling to me. The format of it actually also ended up being very helpful for my GMing style because it's a very close parallel. You can do your preparation, your plotting, your GM, you know, 
groundwork for the overarching course of a campaign. You can nail down what is true of your setting and what is true of the laws of physics or magic or whatever it is for your world. You know, all of that hidden stuff that you have to know, you have to have the metaphysics down pat. And then you put out little bits of information week after week. Sometimes you throw out um, arc words or mysterious symbols or mysteries right at the beginning that you want people to be curious about and that you have absolutely no idea yet what they actually mean. Um, and then you commit to, by the end of the entire arc, having made a cohesive picture out of all of those tiny individual mysterious pebbles. And just like running a long campaign game, once you have put something out there, you can't take it back. You can recontextualize it with um, what you put out there later, cannot just revise in the way that you could with, you know, writing a novel or something like that. So it's, I think, a very effective way to practice the art of DMing mindfully, putting reasonable mysteries out there, training that sense of... Um, drawing connections between yes hello motorcycle drawing connections uh between individual puzzle pieces that um had been sprinkled all throughout in order to make um you know a compelling cohesive picture at the end i know why i find self-discovery play to be very fulfilling and it's how i role play in home games I generally have very little information about my characters to start with. And then as time goes on, I just do what feels right or what seems like the most compelling story. Why do you, and I'll, I'll answer after you um, so that I'm not tainting your answer. Uh, and I don't think we have the same answer uh, as to why I find it compelling and why I am very interested in self-discovery roleplay. But why do you find it to be? I think that the process of self-discovery um can and often should mirror the process of and going into these situations with that sense of complete wonder no context to start with and therefore no you know prejudices no prejudgments uh is a very powerful feeling when playing characters i actually usually do the complete opposite uh i go in with my face ego heart method i know exactly you know what's on the sur surface of my character and on the two layers beneath that i know you know what deeply held hurts and traumas they're clutching at the very core um and you know all of those traits might change over the course of play but uh that's on the total opposite end of the spectrum from going in with a totally blank slate to be told by the person running the game um, that you have to discover all of these things um, mechanically um, as a way to guide your play as well as for your own personal reference as a player. There's a screenshot that makes the rounds every so often of, um, you know, hey, what if somebody ran a game where everybody starts out with a blank character sheet and you're supposed to discover while you're playing, uh, you know, the GM will say like, well, you know, there are no other dragonborn in town. So your arrival, you know, sparks some curiosity and the player goes, oh, I'm a dragonborn and writes that down on their sheet. And that, you know, sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, it also sounds like a lot of work being front-loaded onto the GM, uh, keeping yeah. track of, of the hidden um, character sheets for all of the players in the format of the way that I did it, which is one person keeping track of one character for the uh, dozens of people who were actually clicking the poll buttons. Um, it's logistically easier. Absolutely. I find personally for my self-discovery and characters, and this is something that I got into the habit of when I was a teenager, was mostly gender discovery. I think totally different, but um, very, very similar uh, result in a lot of ways. I used it as a way to sort of explore, but not really understanding why. But same reason I wrote different characters from different perspectives was to sort of explore that and to find out what I thought was true to go back and like revise if I wanted to and things like that. So with that being said, what do you want to talk about before we close out today? Kaya? Do you have anything you want to direct people towards? Yes, in fact. Um, so I just wanted to plug Diversity Saves which is a nonprofit charity. Uh, we just got our 501c3 status yesterday, officially from the IRS. 
So um, thank you. Uh, it's been a long time coming. Um, we are a charitable organization um, committed to promoting and uplifting uh, marginalized creators in the TTRPG space. We do this um, both by providing um, workshops and other educational um, programming for everybody to you know, learn from and benefit from, and by uh, raising funds that we provide as direct grants to help out marginalized creators uh, who may need monetary help in order to uh, create their best work. And so we are fundraising, you know, just year round. Uh, we have a donation uh, form on our website, diversitysaves.org. Uh, you can follow us on Twitter or on Instagram uh, as at Diversity Saves. And excitingly, we are opening our first round of grant applications tomorrow at the time of recording, uh, which means February 1st. And uh, the link to that will also be on our website. And we are really excited to see uh, what sort of positive change we can make in the community. That sounds flipping great. All right, then. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This has been really fun uh, and I think a long time coming. Hi, thanks for listening. If you want to support me, you can find me on Patreon at patreon.com slash or you can find some of the work that I'm doing at vineyardrpg.com if you want to pre-order the book that we made.